Good morning. Let's get right to the funeral service for Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl champion, Kansas City sports icon Len Dawson. This is Inside Country Club Christian Church. Let's listen in. Are more ready to listen than we are to pray. You know the cycle of life and death that leaves us speechless and confused. You know that we grieve even as we are grateful. You know that in Lynn Dawson, you created a unique and marvelous man. We turn to you today and we turn to one another so that together we may celebrate his life, honor his memory, and seek solace. May our act of remembering rise to you as worship. May our tears, our laughter, our singing rise to you as prayers of thanksgiving, not only for his life, but for all that is good and precious in this life. May the longings of our heart be met with your gentle peace. Amen. Will you please rise for the hymn? The 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. From the Epistle of James. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. 
and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Good morning. Anyone who watches or falls sports could tell you that there is a magical age. Just when a young child reaches the age of reason, somewhere around six or seven, where your sports icon is Superman, where there is nobody cooler on earth. For me, Superman was Lynn Dawson. I'm honored to be here today as we celebrate and remember a great man, a Kansas City legend and a true Hall of Famer. Linda, thank you for asking me to say a few words. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my memories and to speak to Lynn's character. Lynn Jr. and Lisa, thank you for sharing your father with us and thank you for continuing his legacy in your own lives. I was fortunate to watch Lynn play when I was a child, to listen to his broadcasts during my formative years, and to get to know him as a man as I took over leadership of the Chiefs. So today I stand before you, not simply as a representative of the Chiefs, but also as a fan, as a young boy remembering his favorite player, as a business leader remembering a colleague, and as a man remembering a friend. Someone once said, don't meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed. Whoever said that never met Lynn Dawson. Leonard Ray Dawson was born June 20th, 1935, in the small town of Alliance, Ohio. If he were here today to tell a story, he would tell you that his journey to the top of the mountain began that day as he was born the seventh son of a seventh son, and a legendary life began. As a child, Lenny grew up alongside his six brothers and four sisters. He spent his whole life on a team of 11. As a teenager, he was a three-sport athlete, all-state in football and basketball, and captain of his high school team. He got a scholarship to Purdue, played for a coach named Hank Stram, and for three years was the captain and starting quarterback. Of course, when he was drafted into professional football, we all know what happened from there. For the last several weeks, we have heard about his many accomplishments. Super Bowl champion and MVP, three-time AFL champion, six-time AFL All-Star, and one of just three men to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame as both a player and a broadcaster. Former Chiefs Chairman and President Jack Stedman once said that Lynn was Joe Montana before Joe Montana. One day when I get to tell my grandchildren about Lynn, I will tell them he was Patrick Mahomes before Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> but what I'm here today is to share with you goes far beyond the football field and far beyond a list of accomplishments. As great as Lynn was as a quarterback and a broadcaster, he was an even better person. Lynn Dawson was a Hall of Fame man. His professional football career began with adversity. For five seasons in Pittsburgh and Cleveland, Lynn started just two games. But then he ran into his old coach, Hank Stram, and that conversation changed the course of football history. Soon after, just before the 1962 season, Lynn joined the Dallas Texans. It took just one game for my father to realize that Lynn was the future of the franchise. After beating the Patriots in week one, my father engineered the one and only trade of his career, sending the other veteran quarterback on the roster, Cotton Davidson, to the dreaded Oakland Raiders. <laughs> Hank was furious. He couldn't understand why in the world that my dad would trade Cotton Davidson to anyone, much less the Raiders. But in the end, it became obvious just how great this move was for two reasons. First, the Texans got the draft pick that would be used to secure future Hall of Famer Buck Buchanan, and second, because it opened the door for the Lynn Dawson era. 
The next year, when the Chiefs moved to Kansas City, Lynn became the town's first sports celebrity. He was popular on and off the field. And within a few years, he led the Chiefs to their first Super Bowl. Coach Dram and Lenny had a special connection. Coach loved his confidence and competitiveness. He once said, Lynn Dawson will never let you see him sweat. It was this poise and quiet confidence that earned Lynn the nickname, Lenny the Cool. Whether on the field, facing down Minnesota's purple people eaters, or in the locker room during the biggest game of his life, relaxing with a fresca and a cigarette at halftime, Lenny the Cool made everything look easy, even when it wasn't. Lynn began the 1969 season with two injuries, one to his throwing hand and a more serious one to his knee. Two different doctors told him he needed season-ending surgery, but Coach Graham encouraged Lynn to seek a third opinion and then a fourth, and finally he found a doctor who told him that if he rested his knee for a few weeks, he could come back and play before the season was over. So that's what Lenny did. He put the team first, rehabbed his knee, came back, and led the Chiefs to a victory in Super Bowl IV. Bum leg and all, he made it look easy with the same quiet confidence that inspired his teammates. His demeanor also endeared him to his fans. He connected with Kansas City almost immediately. He became the face of the franchise. Lynn's second career as a broadcaster began while he was still playing. He would practice for a few hours, and as soon as practice was over, he would run over to the sidelines, still on his shoulder pads, and interview his teammates for the nightly newscast. As strange as it sounds, Lynn made it look natural. He had a special talent to make everyone he spoke with feel comfortable. Shortly after I'd taken over leadership of the Chiefs, I sat down with, for an interview with Lynn. I was relatively new to these type of interviews, and I was also sitting next to my childhood hero. So as you can imagine, I was pretty nervous. But Lynn put me at ease. Not only was he a professional, but he made you feel welcome. That humility and that quiet confidence were staples of his career, and they were contagious. He got the best out of his teammates and colleagues because he let you know that he believed in you and that you could trust him. Mitch Holtis, the voice of the Chiefs, told me the same thing. He grew up watching Lynn, and like so many of us, he grew up playing football in his backyard pretending to be Lynn. Later, as he joined the Chiefs, radio broadcast, Mitch found himself standing beside a legend. Lenny made him feel like a part of the team. As Mitch put it, he would coach me up. He'd instill confidence in our team, and he made us feel like we were standing in his huddle. These are the kind of stories you will hear throughout Kansas City. Lynn loved what he did, he did it with joy, and he made you a part of his team. His daughter Lisa recalls being in first grade when her class had a career day and everyone was talking about what their fathers did for a living, salesmen, doctors, lawyers, accountants. Lisa got nervous and stood up and said, my dad doesn't have a job, he plays football. <laughs> the funny thing is a number of years later, Lynn would say the same thing. When he began to scale back his broadcasting career in 2009, he did his final broadcast on KMBC. He said, football was never work for me, and broadcasting was never work. It has always been fun. On that same broadcast, his fellow, as his fellow anchors were saying goodbye, they told stories about how he treated their children. Lynn would come into the studio and make the children laugh. He would playfully check to see if their teeth had fallen out or help them on a school project. That's the kind of man Lynn was. Countless individuals have their own Lynn Dawson stories. Just last week, a friend of mine, Joe, told me about going to Arrowhead for a Chiefs game. It was raining, so he told his wife, Kelly, to wait under the stadium awning while he got the car. He pulls up the car, Kelly hops in and says, I met a very nice man walking out of the stadium, and he offered me his umbrella. We got to talking, but then a bunch of kids ran up and asked for his autograph. Then his wife asked, by the way, who's Lynn Dawson? 
That was Lynn, never one to brag or showboat. In fact, on the air sometimes, you may not have even known that he ever played for the Chiefs. You see, Lynn was a professional journalist. If the Chiefs weren't playing well, and particularly if the quarterback play was substandard, Lynn would not mince his words. When we watch games in our suite, we always have the radio broadcast playing. I can remember a few times after an interception or a poor play thinking, you know, we should really turn that off. <laughs> Lynn was genuine. He was real. He certainly cared about the Chiefs, but he also cared about the Kansas City community. And his involvement in the community extended far beyond his playing days. For 46 years, the Lynn Dawson Scholarship has benefited high school students in greater Kansas City. Each year before a game, Lynn and I would meet with a young man or young woman who was the recipient of the scholarship. Lynn would always engage them. He would ask about school, their college plans, and their future ambitions. In 1973, Lynn was recognized for his many philanthropic contributions with the NFL Man of the Year Award. Today, nearly 60 years after moving to Kansas City, his impact on the community continues to grow. For the past few weeks, I have felt so blessed to hear story after story about Lynn Dawson. They are stories of character, of humility, and of joy. They are stories of how he treated people, how he made them feel. And time after time, I am reminded of my father. Shortly after Lynn's passing, his son Lenny Jr. shared with me a few thoughts about his dad. I heard stories about the two of them playing sports together, about days at Arrowhead or nights at Channel 9. One comment stood out to me because it's a statement that every father wants to hear. Lenny Jr. said, I lived the childhood that every kid dreams about. And at the end of the conversation, he said, I will cherish those memories forever. Lynn Dawson's character is perhaps best summed up by his mentor and close friend, Hank Stram. At his induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Stram said, when I think of Lenny, I think of honor, I think of class, I think of style, I think of grace, and I think of dignity. Today, we say farewell to a Kansas City legend. There will be more chief seasons, there will be more great quarterbacks, and as we all know, there will be plenty of reporters trying to get inside the NFL. But the one thing we know for sure is there will never be another Lynn Dawson. Thank you and God bless. Take some time for my guys to get up here. <laughs> okay, we got them all here. Uh, Linda, thank you for inviting me to, to speak here. And I, Clark, I really appreciate you taking all my speech. I mean, I got to cut it down to short stuff here, you know. I don't know which one I'm going to use, but uh, this is a time that I just, I don't know what to, how to explain it. I mean, this is rough, 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 rough. <sighs> On August the 24th, this is a day that Lynn passed away. My phone began to ring off the clock from six o'clock in the morning to all day. People was calling me from all over the country, talking about Linda. Lynn, it just, all the TV's network around the country was calling me wanted to know about 
Lynn. I interview radio, TV. It's just bad time. Late in the afternoon, I got a phone call from Linda Offening, talking to me about my loss of my Pam. I talked to her, condoled her about Linda. It was strange, you know, once I saw the phone call. I had a buddy that called me and told me, said, Bobby, why don't you just give a rest, hang up and get some rest. But when I saw the phone call come in <clears throat> from your Linda, it says, Lenny Dawson, I had to take that phone call. Had to take that phone call. You know, this uh, last two months have been really hard. I lost my Pam. I lost Jim Lynch. Now and then. It's been a difficult for me. <sighs> Is this okay? Sixty years ago, Linda and I met as strangers, in this, and we met in a strange city. In them sixty years, we changed it from strangers to brothers. And Kansas City became our home. Kansas City became our home. You know, most people will remember Lenny as an all-pro, a Hall of Famer, Super Bowl winning quarterback. Others will remember Lenny as a Hall of Famer broadcaster at, C at KMVC and the Chiefs and HBO. But I will remember Lenny as the man, as my friend. We had much in common. We were great teammates and liked to win. We liked to have fun. We loved Kansas City. And we stayed here, never left. We both had jobs while we playing football. He worked at KMBC. I worked at General Motors. After the plan days were over, we both represented the chief organization. The, through the community, the chief is alumni. We were also fortunate enough to both be NFL Hall of Famers. I'm, I am pretty sure that Lynn and I, also Jan Stenerud, we're probably going down, we, all three Hall of Famers from the same team that's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. <clears throat> Me and Lenny also had something else in common. We both scored nine touchdowns in the NFL. After football, in our role as a chief alumni, we were traveling through the country, through the community. We, 
we grow closer together through the years. We are, oh man, I have so much about Lenny. He was always grateful for all the people, the fans that supported us. He also knew, knew that he respected not just himself, but the chief organization and Lamar Hunt and the Hunt family. He always conducted himself as it was Lamar was standing right next to him. It is easy for a great player to be popular with the fan based on the results of his plan on the field. But to be popular another 47 years after retirement is a reflection on you, uh, not just his plan, but as a human being. And I know Lenny was a great human being and a great friend. I hope Linda, Lisa, Lenny Jr. will be able to take some comfort in knowing how much he was loved by those who knew Lenny. He will be missed. And I will be joining him. We will be playing ball again later. Thank you. Alliance, Ohio, the Carnation City. According to unofficial history, Alliance received that nickname in the late 1800s when a doctor and an aspiring politician planted some carnations that at that time were rarely cultivated in the US. And he began to give them to his political opponent, William McKinley, who wore them as he ascended to become governor of Ohio and ultimately president of the United States. My name is Adrian Allison and I am the chief relationship officer at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I also happen to be from the same county as Lynn Dawson and ironically attended Canton McKinley High School just 20 miles away from Alliance, Ohio. Today you have heard about the many accomplishments Lynn had that ultimately led to, being, to him being inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Four AFL individual passing crowns, six AFL All-Star Games, the 1972 AFC-NFC Pro Bowl, AFL selections, all AFL selections in 62 and 66, and of course, the AFL Player of the Year in 1962 and the courageous performance when he led the Chiefs to a 23-7 upset over the Vikings in Super Bowl IV. But as a guy who was, raised, who was born and raised in Stark County like Lynn was, I began to reflect on the hometown traits that he exhibited throughout his public life in sports. Traits such as grit, Lynn spent five years in Cleveland as a quarterback. Need I say more about grit? 
But seriously, despite being a number one draft choice, no one handed Lynn anything. He be and even when he became the QB of the Chiefs, people doubted him because he was with an AFL team. He faced competition and adversity, but he never stopped fighting. His grit ultimately paid off. Traits such as leadership. You don't beat the purple people eaters without leadership. You don't win games with great Hall of Famers such as those behind me without a great leader at the quarterback position. And as Coach Stram said during his induction, seat, induction speech, not only was Lynn talented, but he was a great leader. And finally, loyalty. Lynn loved his hometown of Alliance. He loved his new home of Kansas City. He loved the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And he loved his family. And he was extremely loyal to his teammates. In an interview reflecting on his career accomplishments, he said three times, it's not me. It isn't Lynn Dawson. All of, those, all of those numbers do not mean Lynn Dawson. It means that the people surrounding me made that happen. I know better than anyone that my performance is as only as good as the rest of the team. It was these traits and others that led to something else extremely rare. The man we honor today from Alliance, Ohio, Lynn Dawson. So it is my honor to be here today to represent the Board of Trustees, our President Jim Porter, our staff and volunteers at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. The mission of the Pro Football Hall of Fame is to honor the heroes of the game, to preserve its history, to promote its values, and to celebrate excellence together. Lynn Dawson is one of 362 gentlemen that have been enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and their legacies will live forever in Canton, Ohio. As part of being a Hall of Famer, they, uh, a Hall of Famer gets three iconic symbols, a bust, a ring, and a gold jacket. Today, I would like to present three more, two more iconic symbols to Linda and the family. One is a Hall of Fame flag that we flew at half staff upon learning of the passing of Lynn Dawson. And the second, a Hall of Fame medallion that simply says, Hall of Famer forever. God bless you all. Good morning. I am uh, so honored to be here and celebrate the life of Leonard Ray with all of you who knew him like I knew him. And um, what a great day for Kansas City. What a wonderful day for Kansas City. You know, they say that one of the ways you can measure the greatness of someone is could you write the story of what they did and leave out their name? Well, if you talk about Super Bowls and you talk about NFL history, you talk about Big Ten history, you couldn't do it. Len Dawson's name would have to be included every time. If you wrote the city of Kansas City's story, you couldn't write it without mentioning Len Dawson. Think of all the kids that grew up here and their first idol, first person they ever recognized was Len, and that number 16 followed him in the Super Bowl, sat in the wolf pack at Municipal Stadium cheering him on. Maybe they got an autograph from him at one time. Maybe he spoke to their church or their high school. Uh, maybe they met him at the grocery store. Who knows, he was in Kansas City all the time and this was his adopted hometown. Or maybe you were like me and lucky enough 
to get a chance to work with them, as I did. I was 24 in 1985, and the Chiefs had a broadcast opening next to Len. And Lamar Hunt and Jack Stedman thought it would be a good idea if Len and I did an audition tape to see how we sounded doing football together. And so they somehow coerced Lenny on an off day on a Saturday to drag himself out to Arrowhead Stadium and do this game on tape with engineers and producers in back of us. And they wanted to hear how we sounded. So we did the first half of the Missouri Tiger Spring football game, which is a, a disjointed to begin with, but that's what we did. Mr. Hunt, Mr. Stedman listened to the tape, and they gave the thumbs up, and I got that job. But I know that without Len's stamp of approval, I wouldn't have had a chance to work with him and be that voice at that age. And that began our nine-year journey together. And he taught me how to watch pro football, how to broadcast pro football. And when you travel with someone for nine years and work with them that closely and get to know them like we got to know each other, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Bill Grigsby, uh, as Bill referred to us as the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And, and I'm not saying that, Carla, because we're in a church. I mean, he really, Bill was a pistol, as we all know. He was a piece of work. But the three of us traveled the country, sat next to each other in the back of the plane on those charter flights. And you remember some of the wonderful moments, and there were hundreds, literally hundreds of moments like that. But we were just listening to Adrian from the Hall of Fame talk about that 1987 ceremony. And Len in his famous seventh son of his seventh son speech that left people breathless that were watching on a very hot Ohio Saturday afternoon. <laughs> but he had a broadcast to do after the game. So uh, he does all this. He's shaking hands. He's kissing babies. He's hugging people. He's signing autographs. He's in the parade around the stadium, around the field. And we're up in that press box, me and Billy, and Billy's taking off his shirt, and I'm drenched in sweat. Here comes Leonard Ray, man. He is not a sweat drop on him. He is as cool as a cucumber. He was terrific. And to think about his football life making the complete circle, nearby, 20 miles away, Alliance, Ohio, and then immortalized in Canton. On those flights, Bill would sit next to the window, I'd sit in the middle, Lenny would sit in the aisle. Those quarterbacks of those teams would walk by in those long flights from those AFC West cities in Oakland and Seattle and San Diego and LA, and they would stretch their legs and work their way back, and they would catch Len's glance, and Lenny would nod or pat him on the back or shake their hands, but a lot of times those quarterbacks would sit on the aisle armrest I want to talk with Len about the game. And I was privy to some incredible conversations. And all of them did it. Kenny and Blackledge and the great Steve DeBerg, one of the most underrated players in the history of this franchise. And even the great Montana. Joe would sit there on that armrest and visit with Lenny. And they'd talk. And the things I heard and the way they would dissect the game, Lenny knew what they were going through. And they knew that Lenny knew what they were going through. And that made a big difference to those quarterbacks. One of the weird things about Leonard, uh, he always had a camera, but not like a nice Nikon, you know, like he had like a disposable camera that he kept with him all the time. He took picture after, like during the game, I'd be making a call and he'd be over there, I look over, Leonard, what do you think? He's taking a picture of us doing the game. And he'd always hand the pictures. Annie, my wife, brought these pictures out the other day and big, big stack of them and, uh, Kids would come up at halftime and visit, and Lenny would be up there and take pictures of me, take pictures of them sticking their fingers in the Gates barbecue or messing up his notes. Uh, here come Merlin Olson or uh, Dick Enberg or Charlie Jones into our booth to say, hi, Lenny, how are you? Because Lenny, you know, worked at NBC for all those years. So they knew him, and he was just terrific and took pictures of everybody. Visitors to the booth, he would take pictures of the visitors to the booth. He was wonderful that way. And he was very, very kind. Him and Linda were so great to our family. Linda would always send, we had four children, and she would send a silver cup to the house with their name engraved and their birth date. And uh, it meant a lot. When we left to go to the network, Lenny was one of the first people to call. 
And we knew that by leaving the chief's family, and it is a family, that our lives wouldn't be the same. And, and that, that's true. Because when you do the team's games, you know the equipment guys and the video guys and the secretaries, as well as you know the players and the assistant coaches. And boy, we had some great coaches and great people I dealt with. Carl, Marty, I mean, an, an endless number of names. You know, when you walk through life, you're touched by so many people. Some were the kids you grew up with on your block. Some were high school friends, some were high school teammates. Some were college roommates, some were coaches, and some were teachers. And if you were lucky, if you're really lucky, some could have been a Hall of Fame broadcaster and a Hall of Fame player. To me, Len Dawson was kind and gracious, generous, thoughtful. He was everything you wanted a friend to be. And he was like my dad. I look at him and, and I told him that. I said, Lenny, you're, you remind me so much of my dad. And he was a gentleman. And a gentleman always knows when it's time to go. But Len Dawson is a Hall of Famer, and is he a legend? Yes, he's the, one of the biggest legends this city has ever seen. And a legend, a legend lives forever. I know he does in my heart, and I know he does in yours as well. And how lucky and blessed are we. Troubles come and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand. without its hunger Each restless heart beats so imperfectly But when you come and I am filled with wonder Sometimes I think I glimpse eternity You raise me stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas i am strong when i am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than i can be 
Perfect, fitting, beautiful song to honor Lenny. Thank you so much. Good morning. Jackie Robinson said, a man's life should be judged by how it impacts others' lives. You heard of some of Lynn's impact. What an astonishing broadcast career Lynn had. Together with NFL Films, Lynn's 24 years as host of HBO's Inside the NFL changed the way fans watched and consumed the National Football League. The slow motion camera work, the telephoto lenses, the dramatic storylines. He made a nation of NFL fans in the 80s and 90s. He made a nation of Lynn Dawson fans. A good broadcaster, I've always felt a good broadcaster relates to his listener or a viewer. A great broadcaster makes a personal connection with them. Lynn had this uncanny ability to connect with people. It gave him the ability to lead. It gave him the ability to influence. It didn't matter if it was on radio, television, in the huddle, or a casual encounter at a grocery store. It gave him the ability to help people and to inspire people. And as those characters' traits combined with Lynn's quiet nature, it gave him the power, as Otis Taylor said, to speak with his eyes. If Lynn Dawson's life is judged by those he had an impact to, then Lynn Dawson's life was truly legendary. We use that word legendary all the time in our business. The league, uh, it wasn't till 2015, though, for me, that I learned the meaning of that, Super Bowl 50. Uh, the league had decided that they wanted to honor the, the then 41 MVPs by bringing them to a halftime celebration for the Super Bowl. I believe 38, 39 of them were in attendance. I think we had lost one or two, and, and I don't think Bart Starr was healthy enough to travel, but I was fortunate enough to accompany Super Bowl IV's MVP. Lenny and I landed in San Francisco on a Thursday night, but on Friday morning, the league had a orientation for those involved in the ceremony. And so we went to breakfast, we sat at a small table in this very large room, and they proceeded to tell us how the Super Bowl would go. And at the conclusion of the orientation, I noticed a line begin to form behind Lenny. The other most valuable players wanted to have their pictures taken with him. 
we did not move for more than an hour as one by one these football greats entered into the frame. Guys like Roger Staubach, Larry Zonka, Lynn Swan, Frank O'Harris, Freddie Bolitnikoff, Marcus Allen, Emmett Smith, Drew Brees, the list goes on and on. Each had a connection to Lynn that exceeded them being ex-players. It exceeded them being MVPs. They had a personal connection. He was a player's player. Lynn Dawson was a legend. Interestingly enough, while I was amazed at all of these players kind of sucking in the moment, Lynn was frankly more impressed that I was taking all these pictures with my cell phone. <laughs> when, I, when I told him, I said, you, you know, your cell phone will do that too. He said, well, I would like my cell phone to do that. So I taught him how to shoot a picture with an iPhone. In fact, that was the day Lynn took his first selfie. <laughs> Knowing Lynn's humility, it was probably the day he took his last selfie as well. But it was also the day I learned the meaning of that word, legend. Lynn also taught me the meaning of another word, teammate. On September 10th, 2015, I was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Two days later, we would travel to Houston to play the Texans in the season opener. I asked my staff to meet us in my hotel room that night. I told them there would be changes, and I told them why. And afterwards, Lynn put his hand on my shoulder, and he said four simple words. He said, we will beat this. What a powerful word that is, we. And as I looked in those steely blue eyes of his, I realized it wasn't Dan Israel that was diagnosed with cancer. It was the Chiefs radio network. And even though I was carrying the football, I knew I had teammates that were going to block for me and tackle for me. What a blessing it is to have true teammates. What a blessing it is to have Lynn on your side. I know these guys would agree with them. For most of us, life is temporary. But as Kevin told you, true legends live on in our hearts and our memories. Leonard Ray Dawson was, is, and always will be a true legend. Delisa, Lenny Jr., it, these days, we would say your father was generational talent. Thank you for sharing him with not one, but three generations through an entire city. And thank you for sharing him with me. To Linda. He adored you. I witnessed this so many times, whether it was on the bus, before a game, after a game, at halftime. Lenny used his cell phone for one purpose, despite me teaching him how to shoot pictures. He used it to call Linda. The bond that you guys had exists beyond this life. And watching you by his side through it all, I know you feel the same way. Finally, to Lenny, Leonardo. As the Greeks would call him. Man, I will cherish our time together. Thank you for making me a better broadcaster, Lenny. A better leader. A better teammate. But most of all, thank you for making me a better man. Lynn was fond of saying he was a seventh son of a seventh son as if to say this whole life of his was just luck. Well, I'm here to tell you, it was us, Lynn, not you, that were lucky. Lucky to have known such a beautiful, beautiful human being. Till we meet again, my friend. Wow. 
Well, you're going to hear me repeat some words that you've heard. Legend, Hall of Famer, nice guy. And so with that, I'll begin. Saying goodbye and losing a friend, colleague, and legend is hard for all of us. How do you describe a legend? But those who trained, played, blocked, caught passes on the football field from the Hall of Famer and MVP, they know better than me. But as a colleague and a friend in broadcasting, Leonard was a legend. No one in the Kansas City deserves that title or description more than Len. As much as the fans and viewers loved him, he loved the viewers and fans. Linda and Dawson family members, I'm very honored and humbled to be asked to share a few comments about Len. It's been special the last few weeks, listening, reading, watching, all the wonderful tributes and memories regarding his Hall of Fame football and broadcasting careers. I'd like to bring up one tribute that has been indirectly, and actually after this morning, directly mentioned. Len was also in the Hall of Fame of nice guys. I go back to the 60s when my mom, who used to be a waitress at the old Italian gardens, and she came home and she says, you know, I waited on Len Dawson tonight. Wow, what a nice guy. Now, she used to embellish a little bit, so it could have been her sister that waited on him, but nonetheless. <laughs> so in those early days in returning to work with Len at KNBC TV, it was a giant moment for me. I also clearly remember that it coincided with Len's birthday and anniversary. There have been many great people in the history of this city, but as Len mentioned in his acceptance speech being inducted into the Hall of Fame, boy, those folks in Kansas City are really something else. But let me tell you, no one was any more important than building the recognition of Kansas City on both sides of the state line. In social times, Len would tell stories like no one else. I, I just wish you all could have been there. It was an Olympic event. Trust me, you can't buy tickets. <laughs> Another memory and example of Len's thoughtfulness and a chap that uh, Kevin brought up, his caring, his sharing, was when he called me and he said, Paul, Bill Grigsby is not doing well and he's slipping away. You ought to give Franny a call. Well, I don't have the power to declare or ornate this, but Len's a true ambassador of not only Kansas City, but to the entire Midwest, serving again as one of the nicest, fun, and humble people on the planet. Lastly, he was a heck of a Jen Runney player and he still has some of the Dinovitz funds that I'm not going to get a chance to get back. <laughs> so Len, say hi to all our old pals up there and peace. Now, repeatedly over time, you've heard the term goat, the greatest of all time. Well, Len was an ag bomb. I know what is an ag bomb. Ain't gonna be another like them. Linda, thank you for asking me to be here today. The day I met Len Dawson was a day I will never forget. I was being introduced to the staff as the incoming general manager of KMBC and KCWE by top brass at the time, David Barrett. After the group meeting, David was walking me around making one-on-one -on -one introductions. He walked up to Len and put a loving hand on his shoulder and said emphatically, and Sarah, you must know who this is. I answered looking Len straight in the eye. And I said, sir, 
by the way he's saying that. I'm sure I'm supposed to, but please forgive me, I do not. <laughs> that was humiliating to say the least, but Len being Len, he wasn't insulted, he thought it was funny, and he appreciated my honesty. A few days after joining the team here in Kansas City permanently, Len came to my office, Purdue handbook in hand, and schooled me on all the things Len Dawson. <laughs> in November 2018, I had the privilege of escorting Len to interview Patrick Mahomes. With just the two of us in the car, Len quietly asked me, why does Patrick Mahomes want to meet me? I about pulled the car over. I answered, because you're Len Dawson a city treasure, a hall of famer, and at the time, the last quarterback to take us to a Super Bowl win. Len thought on that for a moment and then just simply shrugged his shoulders. We arrived at Arrowhead and made our way to the room that, where the meeting was gonna take place. Only a handful of us were there and the room was completely quiet. We were all anticipating the moment that these two superstars would meet for the first time. But not Len, he was just sitting there he was just hanging out in his chair, no notes in hand, nothing being reviewed, and then the moment happened. Patrick entered the room. And Len stood up so tall and so in charge, he shook Patrick's hand and then conducted a flawless interview. Asking question after question, it was like he was throwing the football back and forth. He didn't miss a beat. <laughs> At one point, he made Patrick laugh by asking, do you make all your own calls? <laughs> Patrick went, no, I don't. And Len just replied, you will. <laughs> Not too long after that, Len and Linda came to the station for a pep rally photo. And all of us were wearing our favorite Chiefs gear, many adorned in the number 16 jersey. After the staff photo was captured, Without orchestrating anything, no one said they were going to do this, but they all lined up in hopes of getting their photo taken with Len. One by one, they handed me their camera, and Len, grinning ear to ear, leaned in for photo after photo. At one point, I remember saying, you know, Len, thanks for taking all this time to do this. It means a lot to our folks. To which he answered, hey, it's your dime. <laughs> Maybe our dime, but for sure our honor. It was our honor. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, what a blessing it is to be here. I, I feel uh, overwhelmed, uh, unworthy to be hear these great speeches from the, all these folks today. Uh, on behalf of my Channel 9 uh, co-workers, past and present, uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, 37 years ago today, uh, Len and I started working together at Channel 9. And uh, I want to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to Len's wife, Linda. Uh, thanks for showing me what unconditional love looks like, truly. Uh, and I got to witness it firsthand how much Len enjoyed it every single day. He loved it. And to Lisa and Len and the rest of uh, Len's extended family here today, thanks for sharing your dad with me. Um, it's a relationship I hope I never, ever took for granted. Now, unlike all of you and up in the rafters and behind me, uh, I have a confession to make. Um, I didn't like Len when I first was introduced to Len. <laughs> But, but I have an excuse. I was just 11 years old and it was 1968 and I was in Cincinnati at uh, Nippert Stadium in the University of Cincinnati. And I was there with my dad and I was there to cheer on the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, my boyhood team. But had I known that 17 years later that Len would be such an integral part of my life, uh, I probably would have felt a diff little different as an 11 year old boy, but I, I kind of doubt that. Um, and as I've been reflecting on Len's life, the one thing that kept coming up is the word humble. Len Dawson was the definition of humble. When we go to cover high school uh, sports teams 
And uh, the coaches would always want Len to give them his players some advice, so the players would all gather up in a circle, and, and Len would always, always say the same thing. I am the last person that should be giving you advice. The advice that you should be getting is from your parents, your teachers, and your coaches. But then he would add, when I was a sophomore in high school, I was only five foot 10 and weighed 120 pounds. And then for emphasis, he'd make the point, he said, and I got beat up by my sister. <laughs> but the truth really is, and Len was so humble, the truth is he was a very good football player as a sophomore in high school. Now, working with Len also had its perks. Nobody we ever wanted to interview ever told us no if I dropped the name Len Dawson wants to talk to you. So that was great. But my favorite perk of all time was going on road trips with Len, as the photographers and the engineers could attest. Uh, usually when news crews go out on the road, we're lucky if we can stop and get a fast food meal somewhere. But uh, Len always insisted on going to a restaurant at the end of our workday. And his reasoning was pretty simple. When our bosses are working out of town, they aren't eating fast food, and neither should we. <laughs> and so, well, needless to say, because I was in charge of the expense reports, it became an exercise in creative financing to uh, justify those, those uh, dinners with Len. But they were so memorable, and, and, and my photographer friends and, and engineers, they all have great memories of just sitting around and, and uh, with Len at dinner and, and knowing that they were going to get, get a good meal. Uh, I've learned many life lessons from Len. One of them was how to politely say no. One time we were out at Kansas Speedway during a, doing a story with former NFL coach Jerry Glanville. And this, at this time he was a NASCAR truck driver. Now Jerry had the great idea of letting Len sit in his truck in the seat. So Len climbs through that window because that's how you have to get in these things. And just one problem. It was so tight in that car that Len got stuck. He couldn't get out. So Jerry's over there laughing and thinking it's funny. Len's starting to panic. And all I can think of is not only are we going to be on the 6 o'clock news, we're going to be the 6 o'clock news. <laughs> and it actually took three guys uh, climbing through the windows to finally get him out. And uh, we've heard this morning from uh, a couple of times how uh, Len never sweat. Well, I saw him sweating that day, trust me. <laughs> Now, everybody, everybody has a Len Dawson story. I've heard stories of Len's kindness and generosity. How he, you know, one time uh, I heard, just heard a story that he reassured a young girl who was about to appear live on the Jerry Lewis telethon that when we did local cut-ins and Len was helping out with that coverage and, and he grabbed her by the hand and reassured her, she was so nervous that it's okay to be nervous. It's okay. And you're gonna be okay. And she, it's something she never ever forgot. And years ago, my friend, one of my friends gave me a couple of mint condition Sports Illustrated with Len on the cover, and he asked me if I could get Len to sign them. I said, well, sure. And so I put them on Len's desk when he came into work, and, and he said, wow, these are really nice, thanks. I said, no, no, they're not for you. And, uh, and then I also have heard uh, over the years, uh, fortunately, we've, we've had a number of interns that have gone on and had success in our business. And, it's been great to, to hear their stories and, and how uh, one of our former interns uh, borrowed Len's uh, suit coat and tie just so he could tape a sports cast as for his resume tape, and, and he actually got that job. And, uh, and then the other, one of the other stories I heard was uh, about uh, how Len almost missed the start of a sports cast one night because he was telling Joe Namath stories. And now this is my favorite Len Dawson story, and for those, those of you who've heard it before, I mean, I've told it so many times to my colleagues and friends that uh, you know, they can tell this story uh, better than I can, but uh, we worked together for three years before I knew Len not only played basketball in high school, but was a great high school basketball player. And I heard that story from none other than Bobby Knight, who was coach of the Indiana Hoosiers then. And, and Coach Knight told us that we're in, we're in the middle of this interview, and all of a sudden, Coach Knight stops this interview, and he says, I want, did you guys know how great a basketball player Len Dawson was? And Coach Knight told us that he, Len was the very first athlete in Ohio high school history to be first team all state in football and basketball. Imagine that. And uh, Bobby added, and I saw Len Dawson score 42 points in a basketball game. 
Now, you got to admit, Bobby Knight seeing Len play high school basketball is a pretty cool story, but that's really not the best part. As we were walking away from that interview and, and story in 1988, I said to Len, I, and this is true, I had no idea you played high school basketball and that Bobby Knight actually saw you play. How cool is that? And Len says, yeah, I love that story, but not because Bobby Knight saw me play. Len said, I love that story because every time Bobby tells it, I score more points. <laughs> Now, in defense of Coach Knight, he actually has told that story to us uh, three different times over the years, and Len scored the exact same number of points. <laughs> so uh, Len had a terrific work ethic, as we, we've heard this morning. It will never, ever, ever be matched. 19 years in the National Football League, 50-plus years as a national and local broadcaster. But I want to tell you something. During the football season, it even increased. And uh, on the weekends, he would do the Chiefs games on the radio, of course, and do stories for us. On Monday, he would fly to New York to tape his Inside the NFL show. But before leaving, he would do interviews for us and tape a couple of commentaries. So he's already had a full day. On Tuesday, he taped his Inside the NFL show in New York. And uh, for every, anyone else, that'd be enough, but not for Len. Instead, taking, instead of taking the rest of the day off, and to make it a travel day back home, right? Len would fly home in time to do our 10 o'clock sports that night. Nobody, nobody would ever do that. Um, the last few weeks of Len's life were emotional for all of us. On the morning uh, Len passed away, I was asked if I wanted to take the day off. But I told him no. Because the only way I knew how to truly honor Len and his legacy was to come to work, just like he always did. Thank you. Bill Grigsby, somebody's already said it, was a crazy human. <laughs> um, and Bill Grigsby uh, was a part of a, a group called the Enshriners. They, uh, played uh, it was organized by Ellie Gates, and they played uh, golf on on uh, Sundays during church time. And, <laughs> and so in August, I think the 4th, uh, 1994, I was mayor. Uh, I was uh, uh, blessed to go with the Kansas City Chiefs to Tokyo to play the Minnesota Vikings in the Tokyo Bowl. Uh, Willie Lanier and Dino Dinovitz were also on that trip. And uh, on the plane over there, I said to Bill, why don't you get Lenny to play in, to play with the Enshriners? And I know Bill may, not, may never have even spoken to him, but he comes back to me the next day and he said, uh, Rev, you know, um, I'm the only uh, non-African American in that group, and Lenny doesn't want to be blackballed. <laughs> True story, here in the Church of God. Uh, let me just say something to the family. Um, my dad, celebrated his 100th birthday three weeks ago, and uh, a little earlier, he was talking to me a little earlier than his birthday celebration, and he started telling me about all he wanted us to do after he died, and I said, hey, I, you know, look, I don't want to talk about that. I, you know, let's talk about something else. And he became furious with me. And he said, you're the preacher. 
And he said, what did the 90th of Psalms tell you? And I shrugged my shoulders and my hands. And he said, here's what it says. The length of our days are 70 years and 80 if we are strong. He said, I am 100 years old. We win. Family, 87 years, you win. The length of our days are 70 years, 80 if we're strong. Over the years, I've come to believe that death is not really an adversary. Uh, in many ways, it is our friend. I say that because life is so fleeting, life is so short, that it causes us to want to live as fully as we can because it's terminal. I mean, none of us are going to get out of here alive. That's just the way God made this universe. Death is a part of living. And so I think that life would kind of be like a child who had a chance to go to worlds of fun and stay out there all day from sunup to sundown. That's life. And this child is going to want to do everything they can do. They want to have all of the fun they can consume. And that's the way life is. You go and get it. And man, did Lenny Dawson go and get it. I mean, I was thinking about this. If he, Lenny the Cool, you know, the, the guy who gets the chance to go to Worlds of Fun, Early in the morning, and he's out there having all the fun, he gets a chance to be chased by 300-pound folk that want to bury him. But he's, he escapes, and, and he's just having fun one ride after another. But we all know that the sun does set. But he did have a chance to do what I think God wants all of us to do, and that is to enjoy this planet. Squeeze every little drop of joy you can get out of it. Love your family so much that it, it, it's, it's almost like they are part of you. You're, they are part of your somebodiness. Man, his life is a lesson to all of us. Let's, let's go out and, and love this world that we're in. It's temporary. He had a, a lot of chances to do more than we will, will ever do. But that's because he could do it. My grandpa, on both my, my maternal grandfather and my paternal grandfather were both workers on the railroad. My, uh, my maternal grand, grandfather uh, was Louis Magnight. My dad's dad was Leroy Cleaver. Both worked on the railroad. But Grandpa McKnight loved to tell me the story. And he'd tell me, you know, at least once a week for 20 years. <laughs> and, and he said, in Corsicana, I, I grew up in Texas, um, lived in Waxhatchee, Texas, for my first few years. And so the train would come through Ennis walks it at you, and then to Dallas, and then on to Albuquerque. And he says, that the, and then it's the um, conductor got on the, on the train just before it began to roll down the tracks, and he had his little stamper to check tickets. And the very first person sitting in the front seat, uh, he went up to him and said, uh, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, uh, you're on the wrong train. And 
the woman said, uh, no, I, th I think this is the right train. She said, no, 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 look, I, I'm, I'm a conductor. I, you're on the rain, wrong train. And she protested so much uh, that the conductor beca was becoming annoyed. And she turned to the conductor. She said, look, I asked the ticket agent. And he told me this was the train that I was to leave on. So the conductor said, well, you know, she really believes this. So he leaves the train, goes to the ticket window, and he says, I'm on this train. This woman is telling me that she's on the right train, and I know she's not. And the ticket agent kind of dropped his head a little, and he said, sir, you're on the other train. <laughs> Look, if you're going to have a conductor, they ought to know which train is right. If you're going to have a conductor, they ought to know where the open space is. They ought to know just about everything. We were fortunate in Kansas City to have a conductor of our football team who put us on the right track, in the right seat, at the right time, Lenny Dawson. And we can be happy and thankful and pleased that we had the fortune to know him. Now, let me end by, by just telling you, um, when you grow up kind of poor as I did, we did that in, in Waxhatchee, you, you didn't eat dessert except on Sundays unless you go to grandma's house. God made grandma's, boy, that's one of the best things God did. And so my grandmother would always serve a beautiful dinner for my three sisters and me, and it was just, we, we preferred to be there than any other spot on the planet. And I'm not sure why my sisters were glad to be there, but I could tell you, I knew uh, what was gonna happen. After we would complete our meal, grandma would put all the dishes in the, in the, in the kitchen. And then she would say, well, who saved their fork? I did, because <laughs> save the fork means there's dessert, that you save your fork. The best comes last. The best is yet to come. Family, it is important that all of us realize that there is a God somewhere And that God operates at a realm that we can't even remotely understand. But I do understand that, that after we finish this meal here in our little moment of time, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And so what I want you to do is when you need to remember this message, just hold up your fork.
power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior God to me how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, and when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. God of every good and perfect gift, this afternoon we praise you for the gift of Lynn Dawson. In your infinite wisdom, O oh God, you created the universe and you fashioned the earth into a humble person who was bold and gentle, quiet, yet insightful, honorable, but always humble, who knew personal pain and brokenness 
but persevered in love. In Lynn, we saw a winner of the best kind, one who did not leave behind the weak and the lost. In Lynn, we met a father who could be the enforcer, but also his children's hero, always willing to listen, but only sharing his wisdom when asked. In him, we met a husband who treasured his wife as an equal partner and a beloved friend. His public witness of integrity would have been enough. But God, you also gave us a man who provided scholarships for other people's children to go to college, who raised money for cancer to be eradicated, and who made Halloween a beautiful night for children across this city. We were not ready to say goodbye to him, O oh God. We wanted to hear his voice one more time to see him smile one more time. Accept our tears as emblems of our devotion and transform them into waters of life that will nourish us in the days ahead. God of all good gifts, give us a way to face the future. Give us a bit of Lynn's legendary kindness, firm resolve, warm spirit. Give us a new season of hope that we might find again the way to sing your praise, the way to care for one another with tender passion. We entrust, Lynn, into your unfailing love and overflowing goodness. Lift him to life beyond our imagining. We give you but your own. Enfold him in your everlasting arms. Comfort Lynn's family and the larger family of fans and colleagues and friends. Make us more sensitive to one another. Knit us together more firmly by your sacred threads of grace. May your wisdom encircle us and, un and unite us within the holy mystery. And may the Spirit of Christ shine through our lives and bind us to you. We pray all of this boldly yet humbly in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you please rise for the benediction? May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and grant you peace. Amen.
thank you for watching this uh, memorial service for the legendary Chiefs player Lynn Dawson, Hall of Famer. We appreciate the time you spent with us today. Uh, pretty moving service to listen to all those speakers talk about Lynn Dawson, his life and legacy here in Kansas City. And so many lovely stories and examples of the kind of person he was yeah. from so many different chapters of his life here in Kansas City, known around the nation, from the Chiefs to his broadcasting career, uh, to his family, and you know, very emotional stories from a former teammate, yes. from uh, people that worked with him for so long and how he touched them. And it's it struck me really as listening to this is when we're lucky enough to live in a city that has a professional sports franchise and an NFL football team, and obviously more than just that, but there's so many of these cities around the nation that have these great players that maybe don't necessarily stay there all their lives after they after they retire from the team. And that was not the case with Lynn Dawson. He stayed and became an icon in this city long after his playing days were over for multiple reasons. And that struck me listening to all those stories today. That was just part of his story yeah. here in Kansas City and around the country. Thank you so much for joining us with this. Uh, we have a lot of coverage of uh, Lynn and, and all the ways Lynn Dawson touched Kansas City on KSHB.com as well. Quarterback gets the snap. Going deep, Taylor 